All right, guys. Welcome back into the flight deck. Captain Abs is back with you once again. It's been a little while. Uh, it's been a couple of hours now, and basically in that time, we have made it across the pond. We are now uh, just coming up to the end of our uh, transatlantic leg, and we're basically re-entering the European domestic airspace here at uh, Malot and Gisti. Uh, let's just pull up my sim, uh, my sim toolkit pro here for a minute, and let's just have a little evaluation. We're 69% of the way there. We're two thirds of the way there already, guys. Good stuff. And let's have a little look. See here. Come on, over we go. There we are. And uh, yeah, so we're just about to enter. Now they have really uh, improved this, which is great. But I might need to turn on some things here. Uh, VATSIM, flights, ATC, airport ATC, it's good to know where all that stuff is. Uh, STKP flights are on. I've got the rainfall uh, overlay, obviously. P3D airports, MFS. <laughs> I don't even want to think of how many that's going to display right off uh, right off hand. Uh, controls, follow me, and uh, map style. Uh, let's just have a look at the different styles here. That's uh, definitely nicer. Map Nick shows us some stuff. Some satellite imagery. There we go. You can see we're coming up there slowly but surely. And uh, what's under options here now? Because I don't even know what's under options here. Font scaling, uh, boundaries, uh, network airspace, fats network ID, MIO network ID, so it knows who you are, so it stops showing doubles of you. Yeah. Interesting stuff. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I don't need any of that. But yeah, so we're just coming up to the end of our transatlantic uh, voyage here at uh, Gisty, and it's going to be a big turn to the southeast to try and pick up that tailwind again on our way all the way down through the various airways to get down into Nice here. So uh, I don't see any ATC online here at the moment. Uh, let's have a little look-see. There was some, yeah, there's some London Center on. Uh, it's think yeah yeah there's some London control on it's having a little bit hard time figuring out where London control is uh, and I think our flight will uh, London control goes to about here I don't know why it's not showing any of the FIRs anymore I really wish it would uh, but London control goes to about here so I think we're gonna cut through just the southern tip of uh, London control here, southwestern tip here, uh, not for about another 30, 40 minutes, but we'll see, and we'll see if we get any other uh, ATC online there after. Uh, they are waiting for me in Nice. I see Jonathan uh, on uh, on tower there in Nice, so hopefully we'll have a little bit of ATC when we get there. We are still a couple of hours out. Uh, we're still probably about two and a bit hours out, but we have gotten a large portion of this flight done. It's quite impressive. Oh, whoa. Lots of eight, lots of airplanes online in. Uh, yeah, yeah. There's the there's some online stuff. Lots of airplanes online in Europe now. Uh, just along our route, not quite so much ATC at the moment, but we will get there. Just gonna turn that off of there because uh, the one thing you find about this, and they're pretty good about actually mentioning it here. They even have some little stats down here in the bottom, but. Uh, the live map in STKP is quite processor intensive and considering I'm often straining my processor as it is to run P3D I don't need the live map taking any more of that processor as well because that's just gonna be prone to causing a failure alright so we're back in the flight deck here captain left the flight deck for a couple of hours had a good long solid nap no I didn't actually have a nap but I did some other some other things that I had to get done um, and uh, I was originally going to come back about mid-Atlantic, and then when I saw that there was no ATC online, I sort of th I thought about it and I said, it makes more sense for me to come back at the tail end of the flight, uh, because basically from this point on, we're probably going to have uh, on and off ATC coverage throughout the rest of the flight. So I'd rather be online now and be able to uh, yeah, be here for that ATC as well as talking to you guys. So we probably don't need these uh, interior lights on anymore. Oh, there we go. That's probably better. Uh, so let's have a quick little uh, status update here, just see where we're at here. So uh, we're going to first of all go to the flight plan page here and just see what the bottom line is. So we're showing 1654 Zulu now, uh, just before 1700. Still about 1100 miles to go until we get to Nice, and we're estimating 12.4 on board. And I think we only need, we don't definitely don't need that much for, well that's really washed out now in daytime here. Uh, let's see here. We definitely don't need too much for the alternate. Come on. Scroll it just a little further. Uh, 
Now that was the original flight plan of Marseille. Um, let me... I didn't download the newer flight plan, so let me just pull it up on my SimBrief window. Revision 2, as it were. Revision 2 here, they changed the alternate to Barcelona. So for that we need 5.5 plus about 2.3. That's 7.8. Uh, and we're coming in with 12, so we have enough fuel to make it there, no problem. Uh, the other thing we're going to look at here, too, is that we're supposed to do the crossing at 360, and passing just T, supposed to climb to 370. So given that we are now just crossing over just there, and in the turn south eastbound, we can go ahead and give her 370. Should have burned off enough gas, we burned off about 27 tons of gas so far. 28 tons of gas so far. I think we should have enough. I thought I turned off the, uh, oh, uh, I turned off those, but it's, there, that's what I'm trying to do. Turn off the glare shield lights as well, so now we don't really need these lights. We also don't probably need the non-existent logo light on at this point. And there we go. While we're at it here, we're just going to have a quick look at our engines uh, and everything else. So our engines are looking hunky-dory there. Uh, Engines. Check. 13, 8, 30, 13, 7, 10. I guess we got a slight imbalance, but just because we ran the APU. No, uh, actually, we, we burned more off the left side than the right side? That's weird. No, uh, the APU in this airplane comes from the left side, doesn't it? Uh, APU, APU. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I know in my airplane it comes from the right tank, but it, it varies from airplane to airplane. Often it's usually opposite of whatever you'd normally start the airplane with. That way the balance, the, the, the load is a little more balanced by offsetting burning some extra with the APU with starting the other engine first. Anywho, uh, engine gauges, everything looks green. Bleed systems should be, uh, yep, everything's looking nice and tight there. Uh, valves are open, pressures and temperatures are all looking good. Pressurization. Uh, cabin altitude stuck at minus 50. We're at 11 and a half on the diff. Uh, again, we had one of those incidents where the plane did not pressurize, even though the valves are fully closed, safety valves closed, vent club valves closed. <sighs> it's an Aerosoft glitch. They still haven't fixed it yet. But it's such a such a random periodic glitch that it's very hard to chase down, and I get that. that onto FMC page. New cruise altitude of 370. Oh, yep, we know. That's what we're doing. Ah, let's see here. Electrical AC. I tell you, who makes green on gray? Because what a horrible color scheme to try and see here. Let me just try and reset my track IR a little bit more here. There we go. Slightly more comfortable head position. I only use about 10% of our generators right now. Bleed, uh, electrical DC. Everybody looks pretty happy, 28 volts across the board, hydraulics, everyone's moving at 3,000 PSI, give or take 50. APU is off and valves are closed. Cabin, wow, looks pretty good throughout. Except pretty consistently, the back, some of these are a little bit cooler. The number one pack's running a little cooler than the number two pack, but that's okay. Doors, everything's still green, slides are still alarmed wheels. All the brakes are pretty much zero. 95 PSI. Flight controls. Everything is pretty much neutral at this point. Pitch is 1.1 up. Fuel. So we still got, uh, let's see here. Yeah, APU is on the left side. Uh, 3480, still in the trim tank. Trim tra transfer is on right now, so it's transferring. Now the valves are open there. It's transferring right now into the uh, left and right main tanks. Fuel used thus far. We've used 14, uh, we've used 28,000 kilos, as I said. We currently have 23, and that adds up pretty much to 51, which is what we started with. So at this point, no reason to believe there is a fuel leak. Uh, JJMC26436 just asked, uh, do I use any shaders? I do not, actually. Uh, I just go with the default look in, uh, in, uh, P3D. 
I've tried a few shaders here and there, and I find that they don't necessarily add very much to the realism. They don't add... I, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I, don't, I find they don't add a very realistic tone anyways. This is not particularly realistic either. There's a lot of things about this sky, and I have to say that's something that in the new sim, in Microsoft Flight Simulator, they have really done a lot of time and effort, I think, in 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 really perfecting that color palette. And again, not perfect. Perfect not the right time, but definitely improving the color palette. So I think the new sim, it looks a lot better. I've just never been a big fan of the shaders. I've never found that they have any substantial impact. They make it look different, not necessarily better. Uh, some things that I do wish they would do a little better, though, are with uh, things like the EFB here. The contrast is really kind of low on it. I can't remember if I have HDR on or not now. I think I turned it off again because it made this more usable. With HDR, the EFB in this airplane is pretty much unusable. Which is a shame because I do like some of the things that HDR does. Uh, but at the end of the day, yeah, I, I found that it because it made this so almost impossible to read, I didn't like HDR anymore. So I, I, I turned it off again. So there we go. We're on our way. We've pretty much crossed the whole pond. But uh, speaking of crossing the pond, it is coming up very soon, for those of you that may not be aware. Uh, November 14th, I believe, is the date where uh, you guys will all get to cross the pond and with full ATC from uh, start to finish. Hold on, let me just make sure, but I'm pretty sure it's a Saturday, it's November the 14th. Uh, and I believe the airports were just announced. Yes, November 14th, starting at 1100 Zulu, running all the way to 2300 Zulu. Uh, that is 17 days, 21 hours, 15 minutes, and 32 seconds from now, according to the website. <laughs> Uh, so just this last week, the airports were announced for Cross the Pond. And uh, one thing that those of you who are paying attention may have noticed is the fact that there are more airports than ever listed for this year's Cross the Pond. Uh, for departures, this year is eastbound, which makes sense. And I never really thought about this before, but it makes sense to do eastbound uh, in the fall because the winds tend to be stronger in the fall and the winds are usually opposing those westbound flights and helping those eastbound flights. So having the stronger wind, trying to do the westbound flights this time of year, they, they get longer and longer because of those strong headwinds. Like I said, we had, uh, what are we doing right now? Now we're doing 51 knots off our right side, but earlier today, we had 120, 130 knots right behind us on the net track there at the start, so trying to oppose that 130 knots <laughs> would add a lot of time to these flights. So it makes sense to do eastbound in the fall. String, the wind's usually not so strong, no, not so strong by the time you get around to doing the spring across the pond. Anyways, um, what I was really saying was uh, the departure fields. So there are uh, 16 total airports, 8 departure fields, 8 arrival fields, making up a staggering 54 city pairs that will have wall-to-wall -wall ATC from one end to the other across the entire pond. Departures this year include perennial favorites of Toronto and Boston, along with, uh, in Canada, we've got one more. We've got Calgary, which is a, a long slog, but that uh, should be fun. Uh, in the States, we also have uh, JFK, also uh, a regular appearance, but uh, not quite as common as Boston. We also have Atlanta, we have Orlando, we have Chicago O'Hare, and uh, this one, I believe, is a new one, hasn't been done and crossed the pond before. It's uh, San Juan in Puerto Rico is uh, going to be a departure field. That is probably the southernmost departure field that's ever been for across the pond, I'm pretty sure. Um, don't think there's ever been anything in South America. It kind of defeats the purpose in South America because then you're in a very different tract of airspace trying to get from Europe to South America. Not to exclude South Americans, but the whole point is to sort of have, uh, you know, uh, the traffic flowing across the North Atlantic in the normal North Atlantic style and have that ATC up there. Uh, not that we want, not, not that we're look, not that anyone's looking to exclude anyone in particular, but that's sort of the routing that people are trying to take. Uh, so a wide variety of departure fields, uh, two in Canada and six in the U.S., uh, furthest west is Calgary, um, the closest one appears to be Boston, uh, and then yeah, up and down the eastern seaboard, Atlanta, Orlando, and JFK, and also in the, in the Midwest in Chicago. Arrival fields this year, uh, again we have perennial favorite of London Heathrow in there, like it always is, I don't think they've missed a beat ever. Uh, we've also got uh, quite a few other ones, other popular ones, Amsterdam, uh, Dublin I believe we had from last time, Stockholm I know we've done before, uh, Zurich, uh, Madrid, 
Vienna and Hamburg. So I think uh, Vienna will probably be the farthest one out, farthest east. Um, they're a little bit uh, in Europe. They're certainly a lot closer together than the North, North American airports, but Europe is generally a smaller continent. Um, you know, the closest one, if you want to do a short hop, is going to be Boston, Dublin. That's probably going to be a five to six hour ride if you want to do that one. The longest one will probably be Calgary up to Vienna, or maybe even uh, San Juan all the way up to uh, Stockholm. Uh, you know, go for distance in south to north instead of just west to east. So, uh, yeah, let's see here. And um, it does not have any information yet about uh, bookings. So, yeah. So uh, what you'll notice about this year um, is that there are starting to be some changes coming to cross the pond this year. Uh, as, as successful as the event has been in the past, it always has issues. And some of the biggest issues come down to um, congestion it's in certain areas en route. It's not usually, the issues don't usually come down to the departure and the arrival airports themselves because um, they're relatively regulated and you have a certain number of flights and generally a lot of controllers to deal with the various phases of a flight throughout from, you know, gra uh, delivery, ground, uh, sometimes apron and ramp control, uh, and of course departure as well as center. It's usually the departure and the arrival fields are not the pinch points. The pinch points are the en route sectors. Uh, there are a few en route sectors that just get absolutely slammed with 90 to 100% of all cross the pond traffic passing through them. And that is upwards of a thousand airplanes passing through this airspace in three to four hours sometime, you know, and I think last year. Last year we set a new record, I believe there was over 3,000. Was it over 3,000 unique connections? to the network, which just blows the mind. N not all of them participated in Cross the Pond, but probably about 1,500 or so crossing the pond last year. Or, yeah, not last year, but uh, this spring, the past Cross the Pond. Yeah, so it, the, 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 the traffic levels uh, have become a bit unsustainable, unfortunately. And this is part of a continuing problem that uh, the Cross the Pond team is trying to deal with in new and creative ways. And uh, let's see here. And I'm just going to just give me one second. I've just got to do one little thing here. I'll be right back. All right. Um, yes. Yeah, so as I was saying, um, cross the pond coming up. So yes, the the trajectory that cross the pond has taken has become almost unsustainable. It's such a popular event, and people really truly love it. And and everyone who participates and is part of the team is really grateful for the love that we do get. But it's become unsustainable in its current format with uh, a limited number of airports. Uh, it's traditionally been five departures, five arrivals. That makes for 25 different city pairs. And regardless of the number of city pairs, all the traffic ends up funneling down uh, through one small chunk of airspace. Um, so the, the ones that are usually the crunch point are the uh, Moncton Domestic, Gander Oceanic, and Shanwick Oceanic. And these... Uh, these sectors collectively see pretty much all the cross-the-pond traffic uh, in in a 
format that's almost uh, unprecedented in the real world. Uh, all the traffic comes along just a couple of dedicated streams in very dedicated, very um, regimented lines between this, the set airports. And uh, it just it always creates issues because there's a communication shortfall. There's just simply not enough communication frequencies and controllers available to provide a reasonable control service to that many airplanes over such a short period of time. The amount of traffic now happening during Cross the Pond exceeds that in real life in most cases. And especially considering that the number of controllers generally available to support this traffic is much smaller than the number of controllers in available in real life, we the, the Cross the Pond team has, has realized that it's just become unsustainable to expect uh, Moncton Domestic, Gander Oceanic, and Shanwick Oceanic to be able to handle all these many uh, airplanes all at once. And especially um, given, given the frequency splits and the frequencies that are available to the various uh, sectors, there's just simply not enough, and it also becomes very disorganized very quickly. Um, there's not enough behind-the-scenes coordination in some cases, and that's something that we've been trying to work on. So, so what the Cross Upon team has done is they've started to take more and more steps to address the ongoing issue of excessive aircraft uh, involved in Cross the Pond. So, uh, what we're gonna, what what's happening now is they're starting to increase the number of airports year after year because that seems to be uh, helping a little bit in relieving a little bit of the strain in the system. But, by diversifying the number of routes, it's taking a little bit of strain off the system of people running over each other, catching up to one another, flying the same route. Uh, it's also by uh, having a, a larger spectrum of airports at both ends, especially the departure end, it's tending to spread the departures and the, the flights overall over a larger time frame. Because the uh, more and more the airports are getting kind of farther afield, the first wave from the close-by airports is generally almost done before the waves from the farther away airports even start. So it's spreading out the traffic over a little bit longer period of time. It's making the event take a little bit longer to run in each sector, but it's successfully spreading out the traffic to a more manageable level. And this is one of the key things that's been, uh, uh, that, that is being trialed right now to see if this will really truly aid um, diluting the traffic a little bit, because it's just been become untenable with the amount of traffic. Uh, another perennial problem that's been dealt with now, uh, that, that, that has been dealt with in, uh, is, is the routings that are being done. Um, for those of you that don't know the backroom mechanics of how Cross the Pond works, um, Cross the Pond generally has always used real-world day of nat tracks. So uh, when it started out as a relatively small event, this was, again, a pretty sustainable situation. But the night before, as soon as the uh, NAT tracks for the next day are released, and they are released and changed day by day, as soon as they come out the night before, the uh, routes team gets to work and starts uh, combing through that, trying to figure out what best way to route the traffic along the various NAT routes. So depending perhaps on the departure or the arrival airports, um, depending on where the routes fall that day, if they're particularly far north or particularly far south, and deciding how the traffic is going to be balanced between the various routes so that roughly the same number of aircraft fly each each of the various NAT tracks across the Atlantic. Now this is not an easy thing to do all the time because uh, what this ends up of course requiring is that at some point a lot of the traffic has got to cross and so trying to figure out the safest way to have these streams cross in very separate locations where one crossing will not distract from another crossing and they're not all just crossing in a chaotic format at one point but rather trying to get the crossings to happen in a somewhat organized fashion um, sometimes a little farther afield so the routes might be a little bit more awkward a little bit more out of the way to try and help uh, get the crossings uh, make the crossings a little safer um, one strategy that's been used perpetually is um, to get the various tracks across before airplanes have finished climbing so, you know, if, if the airports that are closer to the Atlantic, uh, to use the eastbound example, have, um, have some crossing tracks, uh, what they'll do is the aircraft that are climbing out from the closer airports will be kept down lower below all the other crossing tracks, and it's easier to keep things altitude separated, and, and then uh, once they're clear of the other tracks, then the final climbs are given. So that's uh, one uh, strategy that's been used. There's all sorts of different strategies that have been used, but yeah, it, it, the routes meeting usually takes three to four hours the night before. Uh, no exaggeration, three to four hours oftentimes of, of the various representatives from the various um, 
ATC organizations en route coming up and pounding out the most effective routes that are going to use these NAT tracks. Of course, this often ends up being a very late night for some of these people that are pounding out the routes menu and then they that are pounding out the routes meeting and then they often have to wake up four or five hours later to actually start the event. And this again, uh, a little bit untenable in some cases. It just uh, the routes meeting was it's, it's not that it's last minute, but it's that it, you know the the team has striven as Vatsim always has to try and be as, as ultimately realistic as possible. But uh, with the volume of traffic coming, it's just becoming unsustainable. So uh, what's been discussed and what I think is going to be done for the first time this year is that the routes are going to be designed ahead of time. So two, three, four days before the event, uh, the forecast for the winds is going to be examined and probably the NAT tracks from three to four days up ahead of time are going to be the ones that are going to be used to uh, fly uh, this across the pond instead of waiting until... Um, you know, until waiting before the night before and rushing to get everything done the night before and the routes go out the night before and we hope everyone gets their emails properly and they're all sent out properly. If they're done two or three days in advance, then it gives a little bit more time for everyone to get their routes properly, get the information disseminated, um, especially as there's almost always an, uh, a non-event route that is set aside for anybody who didn't manage to get a slot. And... Uh... uh Oh, sorry, what am I trying to say? So anyone who didn't get a slot uh, flies this non-event route traffic. So that information has to be pushed out to the public uh, in time for people to be able to see it and plan on it. So it's a bit of a challenge to get all these routes out there, especially considering it's a rather relatively short time frame to stitch them all together with the, and, and email them out to the various pilots and get them out there in a timely fashion. So uh, what's probably going to happen this year, and assuming it goes well probably in future years, is that it's going to happen a couple of days ahead of time so that there's a little bit more breathing space. It's not people planning it, you know, three hours before the event starts, sending out the last of the emails, but that it's, that the emails are going out a day or two ahead so that everyone has time to plan it properly because it's just uh, to, to hopefully reduce the workload, reduce the chaos, and, uh, and ensure that people do have their proper routings uh, in a timely fashion. The other problem that we're facing right now, and this is a real-world problem that we're facing right now, and I'm just going to go ahead and bring this over here. I'm going to just close that. Um, is the is the non-existence of NAT routes, and this is something again that has never been a problem, but it's a problem now. Look at this. Um, here are today's two eastbound NAT routes. Count them: two Zulu here and Yankee here. We took the Yankee route today because it was more convenient from where we were. We probably could have made do with the Zulu, but it was a, it was a fair bit longer. I added it up and it was about uh, uh, it was about 200 to 300 miles longer, so even with a stronger tailwind, this would not have been suitable. So anyways, um, traditionally you know, for the last 20, 30 years there's always been about 5 to 6 tracks in each direction, all closely spaced, just looking like lines across just a bunch of parallel lines across this map. And then similarly for the westbound ones, there'd be four or five, six of them, again, evenly spaced. Uh, now, look, there's one westbound, there's two eastbounds. This is not enough to handle cross-the-pond traffic. So guess what the cross-the-pond team, and this is, this is because of COVID right here. There is not enough transatlantic traffic anymore to make more than two tracks necessary. Uh, and even uh, three, four months ago, there was only one track eastbound and one track westbound, and that was it for the entire day. Now, everyone flew the most optimal track because there was just there wasn't enough traffic that they had to defer anyone to any anywhere else. But this is not going to be sufficient for cross the pond. Cross the pond is quote unquote normal time traffic levels, if not exceeding normal time traffic levels. So we need five to six routes across the pond. So this kind of setup is not going to be sufficient. So the cross the pond team is going to have to create their own NAT track system for cross the pond. They're going to have to they're going to have to make five or six routes. They'll probably look at the, the ones that are in existence and sort of work from there, maybe two or three below, two or three above, but uh, they're going to need to create their own routes. Uh, so that's another reason why um, starting another day or two early for the routes meeting and setting up the routes for Cross the Pond is probably going to be the, uh, the way it is going forward. Uh, other improvements that are coming across the pond. Um, I don't know if this is going to be implemented, but this is something that has been discussed. I don't know, um, but uh, for sure this is going to be implemented. But something that has been very discussed was the possibility of uh, changing the slot sign-up and allocation system. In the previous years, uh, as anyone who tried to get a slot knows, it's first come, first serve. 
chances are the server crashes on the minute when it opens because 3,000 Fatsim members worldwide try to suddenly book slots all at the same time. So the server has crashed. So to help mitigate that and help make sure everyone has a chance to book, they've, they've uh, often uh, staggered the opening times for various airports by 10 or 15 minutes so everyone has time to book for an airport and then the next one opens up so it's not one rush of everybody booking all at the same time. But that's still... It is a little bit unfair because oftentimes the times that these things are published, some people are sleeping, some people are at work. It's not always they're not always available when they're opened to book a slot, and it's a little bit unfair to a lot of people because again, uh, if you're at work, you know, <laughs> whatever job you're doing, you shouldn't be sitting at your computer book trying to book a Vatsim slot while you're at work. Um, so something that has been toyed with, I don't know if it's going to be implemented this year or not, was a lottery system where you would apply for the slots you want and then they would be allocated by lottery. And I thought, let's, let's think about that for a minute because to me that sounds like a really good idea. If nothing else, a little more fair than the existing system where people with the best internet connection and with no life and they're sitting at home waiting or just happen to have that day off when the slots open are the ones who get all the slots. Uh, and then those who, and then everyone else is left holding the bag, hoping somebody cancels and they can pick something up randomly. I love the idea of a lottery system in, on its face, anyways. I think it's a little more fair. Uh, you know, it'll probably distribute slots more evenly. And again, the talk was also, you know, to make the the, the lottery span across multiple across the ponds. If you win, uh, if you get a slot, this say this across the pond your entry would be weighted a little bit lower the, further the, the following time than someone who hadn't gotten a slot. So that way, over time, more and more, you know, everyone was likely to get a chance to get a slot at some point, which is great, which is a good, which is a fair system. I think it's the fairest way to do it, really. Uh, but it leads to a couple of other problems, uh, you know. Um, it's a little bit hard to ha it's a little bit hard to do that first of all to implement that I mean there's some, some technological challenges to that um, you know uh, are you allowed to have secondary slots that you want to pick if you don't get the first one if you don't get your first choice um, you know all sorts of kind of issues like that but I think it's a little more fair than the current first come first serve system which just tends to leave people who have to work you know out in the cold and and, and I understand the frustration some of those people feel so. Uh, I, I think I support the idea of changing the way it th the way it's done right now. Um, doesn't create it, it does create a whole different set of difficulties, um, because the other thing is that because of the way Cross the Pond is set up right now, um, and that's him as a whole, it relies a lot on the honor system for people to, you know, kind of adhere to the routes they're given and, and try to try to do what they're try to try to adhere to the slot system and, and you know what they've been awarded and there is always perennially every year there's people who show up that don't have a slot that try to book one of the nat tracks and as often as not they get through because uh, there's the, the, the staff uh, the ATC is so overwhelmed by the whole event overall just trying to get the airplanes out that there's not a lot of time spent checking oh you have a slot oh you don't have a slot no you can't fly that route because you don't have a slot it's a little bit yeah eh. You know, and, 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 and part of me says I wish that we didn't do that. Uh, you know, I wish that we just let anybody fly who wants to fly. But the fact is that it's just so popular we need to be able to allocate this resource effectively. Uh, you know, the slots effectively to people who would like to fly. Um, people who are willing to commit to flying. And it's, it's unfortunate we shaft those people who aren't. Um, and, I, and I don't think anyone tries to. I think m in most cases ATC tries as much as possible to accommodate. But this year apparently um, there is going to be more of a push than ever to push away the non-event traffic, the traffic that doesn't have slots, and it's not that anyone wants to push them away per se, but the controllers who are online have a limited ability to control airplanes. Each controller can only handle so many airplanes, and in the, in the past uh, it's as much the fact that there's so much non-event traffic showing up and, and, and either trying to fly event routes or just fly random routings that happen to revolve that happen to move through uh, you know uh, event routes that, that it just it just pushes the staff past the tipping point uh, so something that's being designed in the back end I don't know if it's going to be ready for this cross the pond but uh, there are some new major traffic management initiatives being taken by some of the ATC organizations to really manage this traffic and make sure that no controllers are being overwhelmed and aircraft are will uh, be held either on the ground or even issued holds in the air 
to ensure that the spacing is appropriate and that no one controller is is issued more airplanes that they can they can uh, deal with happens a lot in the real world it happens all the time in the real world weather is usually the number one instigator of it but whenever bad weather strikes a sector and all of a sudden everybody's trying to deviate around it it becomes very overwhelming to a certain number of instruct a uh, certain number of controllers very quickly so uh, usually uh, usually the traffic manager who's sitting behind at a desk behind all the controllers and is sort of watching the situation overall just a simple hand gesture or a, sing a single button press can have them over at the shoulders of the overwhelmed controller say I need some relief and they send and the traffic manager can can wander around to the other sectors and uh, you know tell them pass the messages that need to be passed along this is something that's not normally done in VATSIM because there's usually not the traffic to need it. There's no formal traffic manager. Everyone who's usually a cont rated controller is usually on the scopes trying to handle the traffic flow. But sometimes having one person behind the scenes who's managing the situation overall and trying to pass messages between controllers who are too busy to really even barely breathe, let alone uh, go and, and send a message to another controller, uh, they're there to help manage the situation and flow overall. One thing that they've always lacked, though, as this has always been a job that in the past was done manually with no uh, technological tools. In the real world, they have tons of technological tools. If they need restrictions, if, if any one sector is getting overloaded, or any one fix or airway is getting overloaded, they have tons of tools. They can shut down an entire airway uh, in the system, and the system will not let any more airplanes proceed down that airway. It will, tell, it will prompt controllers that things need aircraft need to be rerouted or held or anything. Um, if the airplanes are on the ground, then they will just simply uh, not depart until, uh, until there is a space for them up in the air. And uh, if, you know, arrival airports are being constrained in any way, shape, or form, then everyone will get a landing time, slot time, and their takeoff times will be based on those landing slot times, much like happens across the pond. But there's never been anything more than spreadsheets and, and some basic human beings running around in the background of VATSIM to do this. Going forward, VATSIM is trying to implement some technological tools to aid controllers in doing this, where there will actually be enforceable takeoff and, and takeoff times, slot times, based on the predicted traffic downstream. This is something that I don't think uh, VATSIM pilots are used to at all. Um, very rarely are VATSIM pilots held for departure for more than a couple minutes, maybe for an inbound, one or two inbound arrivals, but rarely for a wheels up time. This is something that even controllers will have to get used to. But if the technological tools could be put in place, that they could, they're going to be very beneficial for helping to manage the amount of traffic that comes up on Cross the Pond Day. So these are some of the things that hopefully will be uh, coming out soon. Uh, I don't know how much of it is going to be ready for this cross the pond, but I know the team has been working on them. Um, the VATSIM team and the cross the pond team have been working on a lot of these technological tools to try and make things easier. Another thing that uh, I know that has been worked on, I don't again, I don't know the status, don't know if it's going to be ready for this cross the pond, but uh, better CPDLC uh, support in the VATSIM network. Uh, it just takes a load off the controllers if people are not doing all their position reports on voice. If they can just be sent by text and one at a time, the controllers can can get through them. Um, the system has existed in the past. There is a website. There is a NatTrack website that has been used in the past. However, um, the website is a bit simplistic. It lacks any kind of auto update feature. So when another pilot posts a position report, until the controller hits reload on his web on his web page, uh, doesn't see any more position reports. So. On a busy day, you might think to hit reload every couple of minutes, but uh, on a quiet day, you know, if you're manning the the oceanic, you may not check the o the web page very frequently. If there's not really any reports coming in, you may you may stop hitting refresh once you see that there are no reports coming in. So, um, something that is perhaps a little bit more actively uh, placed in front of the controllers, perhaps even integrated into the into the scopes, uh, would be some useful tools. Uh, and I know they're being worked on. Whether or not they could be ready for this cross the pond, I don't know, but. These are some of the things that are being worked on to help mitigate some of this because there is just there is just too much happening, uh, too few frequencies, too many pilots online uh, trying to trying to make voice calls on these frequencies and make the appropriate voice calls in most cases, but just simply the volume of them is too much for the controllers that are online to handle. <sighs> so there are improvements coming across the pond. Not all of them will be ready this year, but the the teams that are meeting behind this have have really started to put a push into finding some improvements because the event is a great is great fun for all involved every year but it's also incredibly stressful for a lot of the controllers because they are simply overwhelmed and I think the pilots feel the same way I think a lot of the pilots start to get overwhelmed and stressed out because they just can't make their radio calls they can't get their 
they can't get any information, they just carry on en route with very minimal contact with ATC because ATC is struggling to just keep up with the volume of traffic. I know uh, last time I did it, which I believe was in the spring of this year, yeah, yeah, the westbound one, and I took over, there was one center position, I took over about two hours into the, uh, into the traffic flow of the event, and the amount of airplanes that I had as soon as I logged in there, I must have had about 25 to 30 airplanes on my frequency, and it took me probably about a full 15 to 20 minutes, if not more, before I finally had my brain wrapped around the, the amount of traffic I had in front of me before I had a good sense of who was where, who, what needed to be done, who was handed off, who was waiting to be handed off, who was waiting to be accepted. It took a good 20-25 minutes before I reached that point. It was just the amount of uh, the amount of information coming at me was just I, I, I just couldn't deal with it. Uh, it, it's not that I couldn't deal with it, but it just it took me a long time for me to really get my brain up to that, up to where I understood where everybody was and everything was. And if you have a chance, you can go back and watch that video because I love to stream my cross the ponds and and watch the first 15 minutes or 20 minutes of me just like, okay, who are you? Where are you? What? 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 And, and it just it's so unprofessional that way, but it's just the amount of airplanes you have on your plate is beyond what you normally would ever expect to handle in the VATSIM network. Even real world controllers would probably choke at the amount of traffic. And we, uh, well, almost none of us here on Batsim are real world controllers. We're all, we're all, we're all doing this as a hobby. There are a few real world controllers in the Batsim network, but the vast majority, 90, 95 percent of the controllers are people who just do this as a hobby. Our brain is not used to thinking at that pace. We have never trained it to work at that pace. So, uh, to expect us to do it, you know, uh, one, one, two days a year, it's. It's just not really feasible, is it? Um, you know, e even in the real world, especially tower controllers have a limited ability because they've got lots of things to keep track of. Even center controllers, like the, the normal limit for a lot of these controllers is you're talking, um, you know, tower controllers, they don't want to keep track of maybe more than 10 airplanes at a time, if even that. Eight, eight to 10 airplanes is probably about their limit of what they can keep track of at a time. Maybe more on the ground where things are moving at a bit of a slower pace, but airborne tower controllers, 8 to 10 airplanes. Uh, arrival departure controllers, probably about the same. There's a lot of maneuvering, uh, manipulation happening in the, the departure and the arrival areas. Uh, 10 airplanes is probably about the maximum that, uh, that any arrival departure controller can handle at any one time. Maybe 15 if they're really pushing it and everybody's on a nice organized star and it's all working out in a very organized fashion, but not much more than that. If you have many more planes than that, you're going to need to subdivide the sector once or twice to divide that airplane, that, that traffic load up among multiple airplanes. Of course, every subdivision of the sector then introduces more handoffs, which, of course, is more workload, so it just kind of keeps on going up and up and up. As far as center is concerned, center, because it generally covers a wider area, there's not usually as much maneuvering. People are generally just proceeding on course on their filed routes. You can Center controllers can usually handle a few more airplanes. They can usually handle 20 airplanes, 10 to 20 airplanes, fairly easily, depending on if they're presiding, providing any lower services where they need a lot of attention. Like, again, if they're covering an arrival or departure controller, then that increases their workload again. But center, straight up center, you can easily handle 15 to 20 airplanes without too much hassle, but even even then, many more than that. And yet you're talking about an event where we probably have 1,500 airplanes. Now, not every sector is going to see those, but certainly the Oceanics. There might be four Oceanic controllers in each sector controlling all those, so each one of those Oceanic controllers over the course of three to four hours will will see, uh, you know, simple math here says about three to four hundred airplanes. And considering it takes about an hour or so to cross the airspace, to two hours across the airspace at any given point in time, these controllers probably have 100 airplanes on their frequency. Literally 100 airplanes on their frequency. It's just an unsustainable, unsustainable amount. Now, if we get some some good tools, you know, we can increase a person's capability to to perform if we have better tools. If we have uh, easier ways of keeping track of things. So, uh, CPDLC would be a great one position reports that are automatically entered and updated in the scope so that the controller is, takes on more of a monitoring role and they're monitoring the situation, adjusting people's speed and altitude where necessary, but uh, not necessarily needing to just write down every single position report. That makes it a little bit more sustainable to expect a controller to be able to handle 50 to 100 airplanes at a time. Uh, 
Anyway, so lots of stuff coming up across the pond. I have been told that uh, the supervisors this year are going to be a bit more um, adamant that people who are not uh, dealing with people who are flying non-event traffic, they may have to deal with a lack of ATC, um, and they will definitely have to stick to non-event routes. The, the supervisors will apparently be out in force watching for that a little bit more, and it's not that anyone wants to punish anybody, but it's just simply to take the load off the controllers. The controllers just cannot deal with much more than they're dealing with. So it, that, that's, that's basically what it comes down to. The controllers just need need the traffic level control to keep it reasonable for them so they can provide an event that's enjoyable for everybody. But, nevertheless, I'm looking forward to Cross the Pond. <laughs> After that big, long, depressing speech. Ah, it wasn't depressing, but uh, I'm looking forward to Cross the Pond. I think it's going to be great fun this year. I don't know where I'm going to be controlling yet. I haven't figured it out. But uh, rest assured, I will be online somewhere, and I will probably be live streaming it here on Twitch, and probably have some videos up on YouTube within a day or two afterwards of uh, of the fun of Cross the Pond and trying to keep track of all these guys. Uh, I will do my best as well to have a tower view up. Probably going to have it up in P3D. I think you can work it in Microsoft Flight Simulator, but because there are not very many AI models yet, um, and I'm uh, and because the scenery at most of the airports is still fairly rudimentary. Uh, it doesn't seem logical to me to use Microsoft Flight Simulator yet for a tower view. Unfortunately, I would like to, but I don't think it's going to be... I don't think it's a realistic expectation at this point. Um, but by spring, who knows? Uh, I'm waiting for Fly Tampa to move to move their Toronto scenery out. Because that'll be the first... Since I generally control Toronto, that'll be the first thing I need to see before I'll control uh, Flight Simulator using tower view. Uh, that and a, a good AI model package, which I'm hoping that there are some people working out there. The community, uh, it amazes me how quickly people have come up with with great content in this community. Um, there is, uh, you know, uh, the A3NX project. Uh, so taking out taking out the uh, the uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator A320 Neo that's built into the sim and basically Zebo modding it, doing what Zebo Mod did for X-Plane and turning it from a really junky, rudimentary model to a highly detailed, highly realistic systems-based model. That's going to be great. Um, I, uh, then there's also, let's see, there was the, uh, the, the there's the uh, GTA project. For those of you that live around Toronto, there is uh, a user who has taken the default, uh, the stock scenery, and he has improved it substantially. So it's not bad to begin with, like it's a great improvement upon where it was before, but he's, he's uh, modeled a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch more buildings around the GTA accurately and placed a lot of stuff more accurately. Um, things like the Marilyn Monroe towers in Mississauga, the curvy towers, they don't exist in the Microsoft Flight Simulator scenery, but he's added them. Um, tons and tons of towers. Uh, there's, there's plenty of areas in Toronto where uh, building heights that were auto-gen were not appropriately auto gen and, and, you know, tall 25 30 story condo towers end up being two story little little flat things so uh he's gone and, and improved a whole bunch of that stuff uh it, it just amazes me how quickly people can come out with some of this material and, and how good it can look in in flight simulator now this new simulator even even basic stuff starts to look really good in it we are getting there uh we're about just over an hour from landing now so get a little probably about a half an hour closer and we'll start setting up for our top of descent now one thing i thought i saw i saw that i thought was really neat um and i saw this not too long ago um on fs elite it's not my cup of tea because it's an x-plane product so i'm not going to be using it but i thought this was really neat um who was the uh, developer um there's a developer that created uh a pilatus pc6 Porter PC6 for X-Plane, uh, and he's now come up, he or they or she or whoever, um, have come up with a add-on for it called the Adventure Pack, and let's see if I can find just the information on it here, I saw it, there it is, uh, Friend, Frenda has released their Adventure Pack for the PC6. Uh, which lets them do a couple of things. You can add things like floats to the PC6, uh, bush tires, um, with with new aerodynamics and ground handling to respect them. But the biggest and most unique feature that I think I've seen in flight simulation in a long time is the skydiving 
the skydiving uh, add-on here um, as part of this adventure pack. So not only can you get Tundra tires and amp and put the plane on floats, but you can have skydivers. You'll see skydivers in the airplane. You can go and do a jump run and actually trigger them and they'll jump out of the airplane. And you can either watch them fall or you can go out there and you can skydive. You can be one of the skydivers. You can watch the whole jump from the skydiver's perspective. You can maneuver the skydiver. You can fire off the parachute at the appropriate altitude. So you can fly the airplane up to altitude and then you can jump out of it and fly back down to the ground and, and as a skydiver. What a neat use for a flight simulator. I... You know, I, I would never have dreamed of doing that in a hundred years, honestly. I, I just, I don't, I don't even know sometimes where these people come up with these ideas. It's a great idea, though. I would probably, you know, if it was available for Microsoft Flight Simulator, I would consider it. That, that would be fun. That would be even better is if you could do that in multiplayer and you can go skydive with your friends. Some one of you guys flies the airplane up and then you guys all jump out and you're all just like goofing around. Apparently you can do tricks, you can maneuver, you can do various poses and stuff as you go down. So I think that's a really, it's a really nifty idea, a really neat use for a flight simulator. Something just a little different. I mean, to me it's, it still sticks to the basic idea of flight. A skydiver can be thought of in a little bit as, as an airplane. And certainly once you get under, under a parachute, a parachute is an airfoil. So you're flying like a, like a glider, essentially. You know, you don't have powered lift, but you do have you do fly by gliding over the air. So it is an airfoil. It is it is a it is a form of flight. So I don't think it's a stretch to want to do that in a flight simulator. So I think that's a really neat feature. I've never seen that before. I've never heard of that before. But what a neat idea! Uh, I hope that that they look at bringing that to flight simulator as well because I think that would be great. So that I thought was really neat. Uh, what else has come across the uh, flight sim world lately? Just trying to think here. Um, tons and tons of airports. One thing that's kind of interesting, I think, is uh, a lot of repeat development already. And it's good and it's bad. I mean, you know, it's dilu it dilutes the market. It's good because there's competition, but at the same time, you know, I you're competing for the same number of users at the end of the day. There's not too many users. Uh, I don't, you know, you can't stimulate the market too much in flight simulation because there's only so many really hardcore users. But um, the two that come to mind right off the bat were uh, Vancouver. FS Dream Team re released a port of their Vancouver into Microsoft Flight Simulator and not to be outdone, um, FSim Studios. Was it FSim Studios? I'm pretty sure it was FSim Studios. Uh, released some more screenshots of their Vancouver that's underway and that they'll be releasing shortly. So those ones will be in direct competition with each other. Um, my full kudos to FS Dream Team for bring for porting, uh, you know, their P3D over. It's not perfect, but apparently it is updated too. Uh, it does have the completed now international terminal that was really just a construction site and didn't exist in the P3D FSX version but now apparently it fully exists in the new version. So they have, it's not just a port, they, it is partly a port, but then it's also been updated to uh, represent the airport as it stands now, 2020, I think about seven years after the original, uh, after they released the original Vancouver. Um, whereas uh, FSIM Studios, I believe, they're not so much porting as they are really just starting from scratch in Microsoft Flight Simulator. The other one that uh, that struck me as, as two... Um, developers obviously competing uh, is a St. Martin, uh, Princess Juliana Airport. He, there is, of course, the good old Fly Tampa that's uh, been around forever, is has been uh, translated over to, uh, to Microsoft Flight Simulator. But then another developer also uh, announced that they were going to release uh, scenery and I can't think of this developer's name. It's not a it's not a famous one, anyways, that I'm very aware of. I, it sounds like it's a fairly new developer. Uh, just trying to find it here. If I can just search back in the history, because I can't think of the name uh, of who it was. Uh, maybe if I just search for it, search for. Uh, let's just search for Saint Martin. Uh, Airworthy Designs. They sound like a new developer. I don't know that I've ever heard of them. I don't. I don't want to belittle them just because they're new. Because it looks like they have done a fairly detailed. Just having looked at their screenshots, their scenery also looks 
fairly detailed. So they may give Flight Tampa a bit of a run for their money. Um, but one thing I will say, kudos to the FS Dream Team guys. They did cut the price of Vancouver substantially um, for the new release uh, by two thirds, I guess. Uh, it's ten bucks, ten dollars US. And if you own the previous FSX P3D Vancouver, you get even I think a thirty percent discount off of that. So it's cheap to start, and it just gets cheaper for those of us that have bought it before. So uh, I'm definitely looking at that. That's one of the first ones that really caught my eye and I said, yeah, that is scenery I'd like to have in my collection. And the fact that I already own the um, the P3D version means that uh, I get to pay the upgrade price, which is very inexpensive. Uh, will probably be worth it for the update. So if I do that, I probably will do a little bit of a review on it. I don't know if any of you guys saw, but I did my first ever full-on review on this channel of uh, Pushback Express. If you haven't seen it, go uh, go scroll back to the channel here. A couple of videos ago, I do have Pushback Express as, uh, as a full-on review, not just a, uh, not just a, you know, uh, a first impression video. I do a lot of first impressions where I just sort of, I take something out of the box and I, I play with it a little bit, see what it can do, and then I never revisit it again. Uh, you know, I give you kind of, again, first impressions, just my, my first little take on what it's like and whether it's worthwhile. I don't usually go back and, and, and revisit these products. Well, I'd like to start doing that a little bit more, I think. Uh, I got a lot of good reactions to the review video, so I think I'd like to start doing that more and more. So um, I have bought one other thing for um, the Microsoft Flight Simulator platform to date. I probably will do a try to do a full review on that, and then I'll try to review the sceneries that I buy over time, um, as I buy them rather than save them up for <laughs> one big batch of reviews. So just try to, to to review them one at a time. Try to just provide some screenshots. I think my Pushback Express video was particularly relevant because I honestly didn't know too much about what Pushback Express did before I got it on the computer. I sort of read about it a little bit. But without having read the manual and gone into it, I didn't know how much, what it was capable of, how well the interface worked. So I hope that my review was very informative. I, I found that I was a little bit struggling to know what Pushback Express was. Like, you watch the trailers, and the trailers sort of just sort of give a hint, and they make everything look really dramatic and fantastic. But we really need better review videos in some cases of some of these products. Airports, you almost don't need as much reviews, videos of, because you can kind of see in the pictures how good the quality is. The only thing you can't see in a picture usually is how the performance is. But with utilities like Pushback Express or the GSXs and, and, and the Pilot's Life and anything else that's not scenery per se, there's a lot more to be said by actually taking the scenery out and showing somebody how, or not the scenery, but the product out and showing somebody how it works. So uh, definitely I will try to take any products that are definitely not scenery. Scenery is a little bit hard to review. Um, it's not hard to review, I guess, but uh, it, the reviews are not as necessary because scenery is scenery. The airport is there. You go and you land on it. Like, you know how to use the product. It's the products that you're maybe not sure how well they work and what you use them for. Uh, like I said, like the utilities. Those are the products that probably could use a little more demonstration. When I was first getting interested in FS2 Crew and in their software, I didn't find all that many videos that really explained how the software worked and what it did and tutorials about it. I found a lot of like people kind of using it. I didn't find any really good videos that sort of explained what the software was, and that was something that I really wanted. So videos that show what the software can do, I think, can be very useful. And uh, so if I do more review videos, I will try to keep them sort of to that aspect. I may or may not do scenery reviews. It depends on how things things work. If I feel like I can say something useful and contribute to the conversation. But I did enjoy doing that pushback express review video. I think I, I hope I provided a lot of great information out there to the community because I feel like there was not a lot of great information about how it worked, and that's an important part. It's not just does it work, but also how does it work? How useful is it to me? Like when you, every person who sits down and uses the sim, uses it a little bit differently. In my case, I'm doing a lot of airliner flying on a pilot's life, so certain tools might be more useful to me than others. Because I'm in the P3D platform, Pushback Express was not really necessary because I have GSX, but in the new platform, GSX doesn't really do anything and the default controls are terrible, so Pushback Express serves a very useful purpose, but I really didn't know how useful that was going to be until I, you know, I actually fired it up and started using it myself. So I hope that just by showing that on my video, I showed how it works and how you can kind of like uh, how you can integrate it into your flying and how you choose to fly.
So I'm glad those videos that that video was useful and helpful to people. Um, as I said, I'm going to try and do a few more of those. The ones that have surprised me were FS Economy. I knew FS Economy was getting popular with Microsoft Flight Simulator. I had no idea how popular it became. FS Economy just exploded my channel. Somebody posted one of my videos somewhere in some useful place in a Reddit in a forum post somewhere. I don't know where, because all of a sudden, one day, the, the views of that video tripled, quadrupled overnight. The, my entire channel went up by like 50% overnight. Um, just one particular night. Like, it's generally been fairly steady in the viewership, and then just one night it just suddenly went just crazy. So somebody posted that link somewhere useful, so to whoever posted that, thank you, because uh, it certainly got a lot of views, visitors to my channel, it got me a lot of new subscribers, people who have watched the videos, and it, it, it started me down the road with FS Economy videos. There's a lot of complexity to FS Economy. Uh, you can read up all about it, but I hope that uh, what my videos have done as well is just taken some of that complexity and broken it down into here's what you really kind of need to know to get going. You won't learn it all in the first time, but hopefully you'll know enough not to waste your money. Because that is the thing, uh, you know, in the FS economy world, you know, you can't really ever press reset on it unless you delete your account and, and request a new one. But the only way to press re reset on it. So it is very possible to end up in debt so far that it's almost impossible to get out of, unfortunately. Uh, it's not impossible, but it takes a lot of effort. It's easy to lose a lot of money in FS economy if you don't know what you're doing. So I think that's why my videos have been very helpful, is, is just to sort of provide that initial guide to get people started. And... and uh, help them help them progress little laser security in the external view here I haven't spent much time looking at it she's a big boss of an airplane anyways <laughs> I do have some nice external views but I kind of don't like those two together because they always end up transitioning out like that. So what if I was to take that and what if I was to move this one down? So, Because I always tend to go in order through them. See, I don't like that either because that still goes through. Uh, I'm going to have to move this one further down. So if we start at the tail and we go to one wing, wing tip, engine, gear, I might move this up here. So I'm just kind of playing with my chase plane here to see if I can make it a little more logical. So you go from this engine, you go down into the belly, you come up to this engine, you go to the back, you go to the front. I find I feel like a lot of the views in this are so similar that I don't know if it's worth having. <laughs> Good, especially when you're at the airports. Very realistic view when you're at the airports. <laughs> that was a new one I created today. And there is spot view. It's okay. I do like Chase Plane. That's a great bunch of presets. I need to make sure I back up that Chase Plane directory again soon. Add it to my list of directories to back up. I look forward to Chase Plane or some kind of similar utility making it into Microsoft Flight Simulator as well. The view system in Microsoft Flight Simulator is not bad. It's fairly intuitive, but the getting around to different views like this, having presets, is not uh, particularly easy or forthcoming. So I think that in I think that'll be a case for. Um, for Chase Plane, anyways, Chase Plane has some some nice features. Again, um, the smooth the smooth transitions from one view to another. I always like those. I think those more than anything make Chase Plane. So that rather than just like suddenly you're looking at the overhead panel, you're looking at the back, you don't even know where the panel is. You have some sense of relevance. So where is this view overhead panel view relative to where I just came from? Where is the EP, the EFD view relative to where I just came from? So by having the move and not just jump, it sort of makes it a little nicer. I think. The one thing I think that they could do, and I've said this about Chase Plane many times, and I've, I think I've made the suggestion, though I don't know if it ever got reacted to, but when switching between the external, uh, the internally external view and back, 
if they could blend that one like the cinematic camera. So the cinematic camera, it does the nice fade in, fade out. Hold on, let's do it. So it fades in, and then when you go to the next view... Uh, where is it? There's next angle. It does a little fade out, fade in. Because I'm, because I'm hitting next, it doesn't fade out. And I wish it would. I wish that when you're when you're switching from outside to inside, a fade would be really nice. I think that would add some. It would make it just it would just make it a much nicer cinematic effect. I'm not sure if that's possible because of the way I think they're sort of piggybacking on FSX's cameras, P3D's cameras. But it would be nice if we could do that. That would add some very pleasant effects, anyways. All right, we got a few people on here. I'm just going to have a look at my fats by the other window because I do see some ATC online on my on my uh, V Pilot, but I don't see them. Uh, oh, it's Paris Control. LFFF is Paris Control, which I believe we are going to be just south of on our route. I don't think we're going to pass through Paris Control airspace. We'll check it again on my. STKP here as it slowly thinks about it all. Nope, my routing is perfectly goes just around France. Or around Paris, I mean. Need the southern control zones here. Oh well. I was hopeful. I was hopeful we could we'd have something there. Ah. <sighs> How long have we got now till we reach our top of descent? Because I've been sipping my coffee and we're, we might need a little bathroom break here now. Uh, Alright, so, let's see here. 16.57, still showing us an arrival time. We've got about 600 miles to go. Uh, performance cruise to top of descent. So 16.31, so 16.31, so I may take a little break now for another 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, just uh, go and have a quick bite to eat and, uh, you know, use the facilities and everything else and then come back in about, uh, like I said, come back in about 40 minutes, come back about 15 minutes before our top of descent and uh, then we'll be ready to sit here for one last full go of it into our descent. So once again, guys, thank you for watching. I do appreciate it and uh, we will again be back in just a little bit here so uh, let's see here we're going to be back by about 16.15 at the latest so thank you guys again for watching I always appreciate it and Captain Naps will be back in a little bit
Hey guys, Captain Nabs here with you once again. We're back in the flight deck at long last for what will be the last time, I think, now. I hope uh, we are back now, and uh, we are getting pretty close to our destination, just enjoying some external shots here. And uh, as we go, you can see the moon, you can see the stars starting to come back. We've been going, we've flown eastbound so far and so fast that we're catching up to the end of the day. We saw the sunrise on this stream, and we're going to watch it set behind us, most likely, before we get done here, because it... We are quickly moving on to the end of the day here. I'm enjoying that angle. That is a nice shot on that plane. Do one more just for fun. Just from far away. You can barely even hear it. <laughs> okay, uh, we really need to hop in the flight deck because we are approaching our top of descent here. It's about 100 miles away. It's going to take us a few minutes to get set up here. So we want to make sure that uh, we got a chance to get everything ready here. So uh, let's check our V-Pilot. Of course, it's funny because we uh, we uh, had some ATC pop up behind us. I almost thought we were caught uh, away from the flight deck with that ATC. And then it uh, turns out that it popped up just behind us. Let's just pull this up here again. I love my Sim Toolkit Pro because it's great the way it overlays me and the route and everything else. It's just thinking, give it a second, and here, uh, this sector here, uh, I'm not even sure what this sector is, but uh, what the sector is called here, LFRR Center anyways, uh, and it popped up just a little bit behind us when we were right about here. So we are just perfectly dodging all the ATC today. We had, briefly, we had 10 minutes of gander, and that was it. <laughs> Hopefully we'll have something for our arrival into uh, Nice here, Monaco uh, area here. So uh, we're getting close there. We are here. We got to go here. We got like 300 miles to go, not even. So we are getting down to the getting down to the end here, guys. It's been a fun adventure, and uh, we got to do the return leg next. So possibly even later this week we might uh, take some time and do that return leg. But in the meantime, uh, we are going to start getting ourselves set up for this arrival. So since there's nobody online. Uh, let's see what we got for weather going in at LFMN here. So right now the winds are 080 at 3. Uh, I'm just going to do this the easy, w the easy way here and just uh, do that. So LFMN. Uh, airport briefing. Anything about preferential runways? Nighttime restrictions. Tests, APUs, surface movement, startup and pushback, runway operations, on takeoff clearance, takeoff runway 22. We're looking more for arrivals. Uh, four left, 22 right, used for landing. Say four left, two two right, use for landing. Uh, runway zero four left is dedicated to landings. RMP Alpha zero four left is a preferred approach. I'm not sure this aircraft is RMP capable. VPT Alpha. So let's see what we got here. Uh, it's looking cab okay when we get there. So so we're gonna right now plan that. Uh, So we're not going to plan the ILS. We're going to see if we can do the RNAV or the visual procedure because they seem to like that. So I would like to try and do that if we can do it. Let's see what the airplane's capable of here. Uh, just one second. I've just got to turn my Sim Toolkit Pro here off of moving map mode or it will steal all of my processor power. <coughs> okay. Um, 
so I believe we have the Nisar Six Sierra, I believe, is us today. Did I click on this? There we go. Uh, yes. So we'll put that in here. And then let's see what we've got in terms of approaches. Instrument approach procedure, so. VPT Alpha 4 left. Yes, I'm gonna say we probably can't do... I don't know. Proceed to Emmett 512 and left turn to nearest and nearest. Okay, so... Cause they don't like people overflying the land, I guess. They want them overflying the water only. <coughs> So let's see what we got in the database here. This will be the next determining factor of what we're doing here. It's already starting to get dark here. <laughs> well, we're about 40 minutes from touchdown, so the sun's going to set behind us here sooner than I thought. It's going to be almost dark by the time we get there, unfortunately. Jeez. It's crazy to think you've flown through an entire day. Don't have much of a wind behind us anymore either. Okay, uh, so let's uh, have a little look-see here. Flight plan, let's check out what we've got here for arrival in Nice in terms of approaches. Looks like we do have the RNF-04 left alpha, which I believe is the RNP approach. So maybe we can do this one. Okay, to try and pick this out of here is going to be confusing, and uh, that plate's annoying to use. Okay, so, uh, we're going to plan the RNAV-04 Lima Alpha approach, since that seems to be the preferred approach. And we're still going to be using... Uh, I don't think there's any approach via, is there? Uh, oh, via MUS, I think is it. Uh... Okay, I'm going to have to just do this because it's just too hard. There's too much going on in here right now that I'm going to just pull up my charts on here because trying to read it at that angle and on that poor screen is very difficult sometimes. Wow, it's been a while since I did that flight. <laughs> okay, I've been using SimBrief as much lately. Okay, here we go, or Navigraph as much lately. LF and open charts. Let's see what we got here. So we're doing the neat... Needs our 6 Sierra, it does end at MUS, so I did do the transition correctly. Uh, it was just <laughs> awkward to read, and because the zooming is kind of unreliable and the, the, the colors are not crisp because it's, you know, being projected into the sim, it's a lot easier to do it this way sometimes, and especially when it's confusing, and I'm a little bit confused right now. So I got set up the RNP for Lima, for left alpha, and then... Initial approach, all runways, and environment visual approach. It's on this one. Okay. So, initial approach, all runways. From MUS, it's a heading of 0, 09 or 0. So, I'm going to just pull it up on this side of the screen here. Yeah, manual 090, the deceleration, BISPO, FNO, 4 alpha, MK4, 4, 4 alpha. Uh, show me my Navigraph charts again. And uh, where's my RNP4 
four alpha, this one here, four left, yeah, four alpha from four left or right. Uh, four alpha. Okay, so, uh, yeah, for final approach, C110, 110B. Initial approach, we can do it this way here. We do have a transition in there, so. Alright, this is confusing, but we'll get it. Uh, while we're at it here, let's just do this really quickly. Let's just do. Uh, uh, let's just set up the arrival here. So we're going to be doing the flaps 3 arrival. Uh, let's see here. 1011. So we have to set that. 1011 on the meter, and it's 18 degrees. 18 degrees. And Barrelman's on this one. Uh, to do the RNP Alpha. Barrelman's are 2000. Two thousand barrel mints. Pick three. We got a speed of one thirty four, one thirty nine. Okay. This will be a little bit fun here. We're gonna do some visual maneuvering here. Yes, yes. We'll also set that one to hectopascals. Then you'll be happy. They're both linked together, and we should be descending now. <laughs> All this time it's taken me just to get organized over what I'm doing here. So let's go ahead and go into manage descent two one zero for now. And uh, yeah. Are you ready for the approach briefing? Ready. Let me just watch this thing here, make sure it doesn't overspeed here, but it's, there you go, it's, engines are cycling down, we've caught up to our VNAP profile that we prefer, good. Okay, so we're going to do it off of here, because this is just, uh, I'm a little bit confused. <laughs> uh, it's easier if you're doing a straight in transition to an ILS, it really truly is, but I, I would rather fly it the way it's supposed to be flown, so this is the way, uh, these guys indicate to do it, so that's what we're going to do. Okay, uh, so, uh, initially we're going to do the star. We're doing the Nisar 6 Sierra arrival into uh, Nice today. Uh, max 250 knots below flight level 100 was assigned by ITC. RNAV, a transition level by ITC, RNAV 5. That's no problem. We're going to be Nisar at or below 360. So hold on, I've just got to get this. Pause this. There we go. So it's not distracting behind there. So our next fix is Nisar nice, at or below 340. Uh, Zerbi at or below 320, above 200. Uh, and then for Sierra, we go uh, Giral. Amfu at or below 16,000. That's pretty close there, anyways. Oops, didn't mean to do that. There we go. Uh, and then we go to Ampu, Ampu below 16,000, Tipic at 12,000 and max 250, or at flight level 120 at uh, 12. And then over to the MUSVOR. Uh, and then from there, we're going to either get a vector 090 or there is a transition as well. So we can do an, an, this uh, transition here. So can I actually set that in here? Uh, arrival. Can I do approach via via? Yeah, I did do that. Uh, hold on. So let's check what it says here. Uh, it does have all those MUS, and then in here it just has direct to Bisbo. So it seems to be missing the transition. So I'm going to request a vector to Bisbo. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure how. But I can't seem to have that in there. So we'll have to just fly it. Uh, have to be either vectors or direct to Bisbo. So we can do the initial approach, which is uh, just heading 09 or 0, and request a vector to Bisbo. Uh, we are not, uh, yeah. Our approach today is the, uh, RNF, RNP Alpha 04 left. Uh, mandatory altitude at FN 04A is 3000. Let's just make sure that's in there. Yeah, that's in there. And then, uh, MDA is 2,000. We've got 2,000 feet set. Airport elevation's at 12 feet. The, uh, north of the field, there's some very high mountains. So 10,700 is the MSA on that side. Let's not go there. At, 
and uh, the missed approach procedure at MN04 Alpha, right turn, max at 185 knots to MN504, max, maintain max 3000, then proceed to MN512, uh, then turn left to nearest, at nearest join the holding pattern as marked at 3000, so right turn over to 504, and then at 512 make a left turn to nearest. In order to not overfly the Cape City of Antibas, do not fly west of the 174 radial of CGS, so I'll see if we can dial up CGS and get that in there. Um, three degree glide path angle is what's set to get us down to the 2000 MDA and then the final approach course we've got to see over here uh, nope there's a separate chart for final approach courses somewhere somewhere uh, uh, anyways we don't go west of this uh, radio we don't go over land and we just uh, intercept onto final. I may pull up the ILS frequency as well, just to give us something to sort of track down once we get onto final approach. Uh, so for four left, it's 109.95. So let's see if I can set that up real quick here. Uh, nav radios, 109.95. And inbound course I need as well. Oops. Of uh, 043. There we go. And I might even set that CGS VOR 109.2. 109.2 on the other side here. And an inbound course, so the reciprocal of what's our limitation here? 174. So that'd be 354 would be the reciprocal. So that'll give us something to enter to hopefully visually see on number two. All right, uh, so terrain is high north of Veal, 10,700, so we're going to stay south of it as much as possible, where the, the atmospheres are 3,000. Weather is, uh, weather is, uh, cav okay, light winds, and, uh, that's about it. I'm going to set the 1,2,000 there for the crossing restriction, 1,2,0, and, uh, I think that's about it. Uh, fuel, as we said, we need about, uh, what is it? 7.8, I think. So we got uh, a little 13 tons now, and when we get there, we're gonna have 12 and a half. So we got lots. Any questions? Okay, that's uh, checked, and no questions. It's gonna be dark by the time we get there. I didn't realize this. I must have got the sunset time wrong somehow. Putting all the lights back on again. speed brake. It seems to be having a hard time slowing down enough here, so let's get the speed brake out a little bit there. Alright, and we got some ATC, we got some... Uh, no we don't. I thought it said LFMN, but it's not. It's L-I-M-M. So we got no ATC. I thought we were going to have some ATC here, but we did not. Oh well. And here I thought we had timed it pretty well to arrive kind of in the evening rush. We'd get some fat some ATC online this time this time of day. Apparently the answer is no. <laughs> Alright, speed's back to 250. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Oh, hold on. There we go. Any questions? Okay, that's uh, checked, and no questions. All right, next is going to be the approach checklist. We are almost there, guys. We are almost there. And uh, I see a little bit of activity happening around here. L-F... L-I-M-M, what is that? Uh, Milan. Uh, yeah, there's another airplane inbound to Nice around the same time as us. There's a few people flying around this area, so we got to keep our eyes open. Make sure that we are aware of what's going on. Just have another little sip of my coffee here, and away we go. But it does seem like we're going to make it today. Do I dare to say that ahead of time? Or have I just cursed myself? <laughs> We're almost there. Alright, so 
before I forget it, we are doing an RNAV approach. I'm going to bring up the localizer, however, because the localizer is going to give me a little bit of feedback there. And uh, I do have the bearing, yeah, I do have the bearing pointer set to number two. <coughs> Excuse me. So as we approach Nice here, we're going to get, uh, we're going to vector ourselves to that final approach course. It's going to be a visual type approach. Offshore and then just uh, join final manually. It's actually going to be a bit of a fun challenge. I haven't uh, done this approach, I think, before when I came here just did the ILS. I didn't read the uh, plates that carefully. Actually, one thing I did not do, and I probably should do, is read the NOTAMs. Flight plan. Watch me find out that four left is closed after that all that setup. NOTAMs, NOTAMs, destination airport, stand nine closed, taxiways. Alpha 2, Bravo 2, Charlie, Good Golf 2, Echo Fox, Echo Yankee closed. Oh, jeez, Louise. Where is my charts? <laughs> I'm going to put these up on my other screen so I can look while I'm reading. Uh, let's see here. There it is, 10-9. So. Uh, Alpha 2, Bravo 2, Charlie 2. There's Alpha 2. Bravo 2, Charlie 2. Tango closed between Delta and Romeo closed. Echo Fox and Echo Yankee. It seems like 4 right might be closed right now. Because it seems like all the taxiway connections are closed, or a whole bunch of them are. Uh, taxiway Tango between Delta and Aircraft 10 61 Fox closed. Tango, where's Delta? Delta and 61 Fox. I should have the apron parking stands out for this, otherwise I'll never see what I'm doing. Okay, Delta and 61. Okay, that whole section's closed. Uh, Romeo, closed. Where's Romeo? Romeo, Romeo, wherefore art thou, or Romeo? <laughs> I had to do it. I don't see Romeo anywhere. Where the heck is Romeo? Oh, there it is. Okay. So that's Romeo. Fine. Sierra closed between Delta and 12 Bravo. Delta and 12 Bravo, yep. Taxiway Sierra between Charlie and Delta limited to 36 meters. Sierra between Charlie and Delta limited to 36 meters, so we're not going to go that way. Uh, 5, 7, 11, 13, 15. <coughs> Excuse me, 5, 7, 11, 13, 15. And 61, 63, 65, 67 are all closed. Uh, lots of stuff in here. Aircraft stands 12, 14, 16, 20. Into the reduced wing tip margins, turns from Sierra, and mount. Yeah, those are already all closed anyways. Um, trains. Four right, two, two left closed. There we go. So good thing we're landing on four left. <laughs> already. And ILS to four right is also unserviceable, which makes sense if the runway's closed. And air drum operating minimum, modified. ILS can three. Okay, nope. All right, well, we didn't get any ATC coming online, but that's okay. We're going to get there one way or another. Uh, what was the altimeter setting here? We're going to need to extend the speed brake in a minute, but we got lots of margin now below the speed limit, at least. Uh, 9999. So I'm going to go ahead and set it on here. Oh, sorry, that's not the altimeter setting. That's the visibility. 1011 the altimeter setting, so it's almost standard. It's very close to standard. Alright, we're getting there. You can see now the coast of the Mediterranean. Uh, we're going to basically head a little bit offshore and turn to the left and do the approach. So off over there is our uh, arrival airport. Not too far away now. Now we're quite a bit above our required track, our required vertical position at this point. So we're going to get the speed brakes out because we're supposed to be down at 12,000. This airplane did not manage its descent well at all. And I don't know why. And I was too busy looking at the NOTAMs to realize it. So, there you go. 
while we're at it, let's go ahead and put on the seatbelts. Approach checklist. Okay, approach checklist. Briefing? Complete. Confirmed. Ecam status. Checked. Seatbelts. On. Arrow ref. Thousand to go. Standard set. One zero one three set. One zero one three set. M D A D H. Minimums two thousand feet set. Two thousand feet set. Two zero 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 feet set. Engine mode selector. Norm. All right, approach checklist is complete. But you got to stay on standard for a little while longer here. Manually set the speed to 250. And let's see here. So it should automatically turn left and fly the 090 heading, and then as we get a little closer, we'll just go direct to our initial fix there. I think it's Big Bow. We'll wait till we just get offshore here, just after our turn here shortly. Once we get on the offshore there, then we should be good to descend to 3000. Flight level one zero zero. Checked. Whew. What an epic voyage across the pond, I tell ya. It is a long way. We did it in good time though, I've gotta say. We have made some fantastic time here because of the uh uh because of those tailwinds today. That turn back is going to be a lot worse. Okay, it did not make the turn that I thought it was going to make, so... Here's the 090 heading. And we're pretty much offshore here. We're not going down particularly quickly, and we're pretty much offshore here, so... Are we in VS mode, or are we in... Management? We're in VS mode, okay, so... What we can do is we can switch to FPA mode, and let's just take it back a notch to 3 degrees. Even 2.5. And, and just set up a glide so that we're... Yeah, 2.5 is a little bit too, too late. Let's do 2.8. Oh, let's do 3. It's taking, a, it's taking too long to recalculate here. Because you definitely want to be level before we get to that point. So we got to have a, some room to decelerate as well. That's the other thing we're going to need on this approach. We're going to need room to decelerate. But I believe Nice is around the next corner there. One of those ones there, anyways. We are going to need... Uh, wow, she really accelerated there. Uh, we are going to need... We should be 250 knots. Come on, plane, keep it under control here. We're going to need a gate. There. I, I got us our deceleration there. Uh, we're going to need a gate. There's Nice right there. You just saw the runways there for a second, so we're almost there. Uh, LFMN, Nice, uh, gate, bravo. Flight deck. And, uh... Okay, thanks for letting me know. Captain we'll do the, Bravo uh, 52, I guess. I don't know where else to go, so Bravo 52 it is. Handling by Air France, that's fine. Thank you. Alright, we're going to start dialing the speed back here already to 220. Once again, she picked up a lot of speed in the descent here.
And we don't have a transition altitude by ATC, so we are going to now set. Kind of Nice traffic, good evening. Transat 648 is uh, 15 miles west of the field. 4100 uh, planning the RNP Alpha, runway 04 left. 1000 to go. Checked. So we'll wait pretty much till we level off, then we'll make that turn inbound. It'll make it so we're not making a sudden turn at Bilbo, but we're making our turn at Big Bow. Big Bow? Bisbo. Bisbo. So we're making no more than a 45 degree turn at Bisbo as we establish ourselves on that final approach course. On the approach, where's my charts? Just to keep it referenced here. Uh, Why is it not, uh... It went through it in FPA. Alright, that's okay, we're getting the altitude back. We'll start climbing pretty quick here, there's the alt star. So I didn't realize in FPA it descended right through the altitude, I wasn't... Good thing I, I was watching it fairly closely there. Let's go, uh... Bisbo. Get this sucker slowed down again and ready to go down to the next altitude. So it's level there, 2000 is the next altitude. Flaps 1. Oh, I need that unmuted. Flaps 1. Flaps 1. Speed checked. Flaps 1. At least it's a fairly nice night out here. I hope that this is still coming across pretty well with the level of light that's left. It's a little dark, but it's not too bad. One, zero, one, one, cross-checked. But it is a beautiful, it is a beautiful stretch of coastline out here. It's a pity that the sun has already gone down. Uh, you can see the nice runway out there ahead. Beautiful area out here. You'll still see some of the scenery as we come in here. When we depart, it'll definitely be daytime. We'll definitely depart daytime, arrive daytime. It'll be easy to do the westbound flight with the day stretched out. The eastbound flights, especially this time of year with the days getting so short, hard to squeeze in into uh, a whole day here. We left in the dark and it's dark again already. Crazy to believe that. Alright, hopefully that Egypt air is just about down. I think that's him there, or maybe he's in the mist. Alright, so you can see localizer, it shows we're above, or below the glide slope, we're over to the right of this uh, low center line. We basically are just going to track up over here across this peninsula and then a right turn on to final. So we'll have the localizer just to guide us. That'll be nice to have. Hello, this is the Alpha going around. Alright, so once we do this, uh, once we cross the next fix, we go down to three to 2,000. Use this occasion to decelerate a little bit here. Transat 648 is crossing Bisbo RNP Alpha, about uh, 12 miles final. Yeah, I thought I saw him going around. Do you see him out there? I don't see him out there. Alright, it's going to take him a while to get around and come get organized, so I don't think he's going to be a risk to us at this point.
Flaps two. Flaps two. Speed checked. Flaps two. Gear down. Gear down. Why is it not going? Damn it. I thought I engaged it. It didn't engage properly for some reason. It's not good. slowed up here. Set it to VREF right now and let it just slow down. Disengage the autopilot. Flaps three. Speed checked. Flaps three. Cabin crew seats for landing. Landing checklist. Okay. Landing checklist. 100 above. Cabin crew, 100 above. Minimum. Minimum. Landing. Advised. Auto thrust. Speed. Ecam memo. Landing, no blue. Landing checklist complete. Checked. We're above the glide slope. So Checked. we're going to keep this fairly wide here. Not going to cut the corner at all. Catching the glide slope though. So we're just going to make this here. This giant beast of an airplane. Catching the glide slope, catching the speed. We're a little bit high. Correcting. Loke. Checked. Overshot that loke. 1,000. 1,000. Sink rate. Stable. Bank. Checked. There, that just worked there. We got it just down the nick of time. Cancel last command. Check. He was turning something. Happy's now, anyways. Three hundred. Two hundred. One hundred. Fifty. Forty. Thirty. Twenty. Retard. Spoilers. Reverse green. D cell. Checked. Well, she really wants to pull to the left a little bit here. 70 knots. Checked. Whoa, whoa, whoa. She really wanted to pull to the left there. Checked. Nice traffic. Transat 648 is vacating a runway 4 left on Foxtrot 1, taxiing to the gate. I think we're nice traffic, get out to the 3 Alpha. We are now we're continuing uh, with, with visual approach 104 left. Get this big beast. Okay to clean up. Okay.
okay to clean up. All right, wow, we made the visual approach. It was a little tight there at the end of the day. Not as ideal as we would have wanted. I think we just go straight in here. Um, mostly because... Uh, mostly because that one descent we thought I thought we had going, we did not. And I should have been more on it. Foxtrot one. No, no, we gotta go. Shoot, we gotta go left, and that taxiway's closed, so we gotta go left here. Okay, so we've, we're further along than I thought we were. I thought the terminal was right in front of us, but we actually need to go left. We got there just in time. Okay, so... It was because uh, that taxiway was the one that was closed, so we got to come this way, or we would have been stuck and would have had to go to a three uh, a loop anyways. We might actually see this guy land here, too. That might be kind of fun. With any luck, we may see this guy land again. I don't see him on the TCAS right now. He said he's starting the visual approach again. I don't think we're going to see him land. But there we go. We made it, guys. Wow, I can't believe it. We got an, a flight done in the A330. That's... Sad as it is, that's always surprising to me when we have a successful flight in the 330. It just doesn't like me for some reason. I don't know why. It doesn't like me. It doesn't like my computer. Something about it. And I can fly the 320s. I can fly the pants off the Airbus 3, the Airsoft 320. No problem. But for some reason, the 330 and me just do not get along. So thank goodness. Thank goodness we did get along this time. Okay, uh, just have a quick look here. Is there another taxi lane? There's Delta taxi lane, and then there's Charlie taxi lane, and that'll be the one we want to take. So this should be Delta taxi lane here, just on this side of the emergency services building there. And then, yeah, right there below the blue, uh, right at the main part of the terminal there, I think is where we're going. So uh, I forget which gate. I think we selected 50. We're going to look for our marshalers as well. Got our APU running. Uh, let's just make sure he did set the lights correctly. He did turn off the landing light. The stro strobes are also off. Yeah, okay, we're good. Okay, good. All the stuff got set up there. Oh, uh, look, there's Egypt Air. Do you guys see it out there? For some reason, my left brake really pulls. And my right brake doesn't do anything. Or I really have to push it further. They don't seem to be going uniformly. Notice the left brakes are much hotter than the right brakes here. Uh, I thought I was applying even pressure. But I apparently was not, so... Here comes Egypt Air on his visual approach, but we're gonna turn in here to the gate. Uh, let's just check GSX Bravo 52, so one of these gates here. And that looks like my ground equipment there, maybe. Yeah, that's my GSX ground equipment there. So we just gotta go this way... This is 50 right here. And that's 52 Alpha, but we're not parking 52 Alpha, we're parking 52. So is the next one just 52? 52 Bravo. 52 Charlie. I don't know which one to park at. Uh, <laughs> do I see my marshaller anywhere? I really don't know where to park here. Uh, I really don't know. I don't see... Oh, is that the marshaller there? I think I see the marshaller, actually. Okay, so it's this diagonal line I'm parking on. Okay, okay. Because <laughs> I just had gate 52. I didn't know 52 Alpha Charlie Bravo. I didn't know which one to do, so... Uh, taxi light off. So we don't blind our marshaller. And this plane really also really wants to take off on me, and I don't know why. She's really, I guess, I guess it's pretty late now. We burned off 40-something uh, tons of fuel, so she's she's quite light now, relatively speaking, for this airplane. So she will go pretty quickly here. Not the best uh, parking job I ever did. Didn't know which line I was really aiming for. All right. Parking brake is set, the APU is on. And shut her down. And I think I heard a little pring. I've parked a bit short and askew. Well, screw you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I had a log flight. I'm happy to be here. Uh, come on. There we go. Ah, what was that? Good. 
Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. Parking checklist. Okay, here's the parking checklist. APU bleed. On. Engines. Off. Seat belts. Off. Exterior lights. Set. Fuel pumps. Off. Parking brake and jocks. Set. Parking checklist is complete. There we go. All right. Got that done. They're docking the bridge to the airplane. And we can request deboarding, and we're done. Whew. That was uh, epic. Where's Egypt there? Is he here yet? Where did he go? Oh, is that him down there? Oh, yeah, there he is. He's taxing in. If I can just find my button there, I can zoom in on him. He's just down there at the end. The Egypt there was El Al. It was El Al. I thought he said Egypt there. It was El Al. I was listening that close. Anyways, he's taxing in. But we are here, guys. Cockpit to ground. Cockpit to ground. Go ahead. Please connect external power. GSX is still waiting for its marshalling to finish, so we're just going to reset it. Five, four, three, two, one. Try it again. And request deboarding. Alright, but we made it, guys. We did another. Congratulations on your promotion. My salary has been increased to 34. All right, so he's going to start deboarding uh, Air Transat. And here I've referred to as the employer. I am now a senior first officer with a remuneration of thirty-four fifty-three an hour. So I have now got a new promotion at my job here at Air Transat. Fantastic. Love it. Why does it not... There we go. Okay, so I was going to say, why did it still say end flight? I just hadn't cycled through yet. So now I just have one flight left to go from uh, Nice back to Toronto. And, uh, yeah. So now we're going to make $35 an hour. I wonder if that's going to be retroactive for all the hours I did this month because it's payday in about four more days. $35 an hour for those hours I did. I mean, we just did eight hours just now. That's going to be uh, quite a lucrative. Uh, let's see here. Current month. I just want to see how many hours current month. Maybe we did two flights or maybe three. 10 hours at 34. That's going to be 300 bucks. That's going to be not bad of an earning. So uh, we've gotten a good raise here. So uh, yeah, I'm pretty uh, I'm pretty impressed. We have made some progress. I have I have now uh, signed a contract not to take a new job for seven days because I earned a promotion. But uh, and they won't let me have any promotion any jobs here anymore. So too bad. Stuck with Transat for at least one more leg. But uh, yeah, wow guys, thank you so much for sticking with me through this stream. Uh, that was. Uh, that was good fun. I I enjoyed it. A little stressful sometimes with this airplane, just not knowing if it's going to make it to the destination or not. <laughs> tried this once before already and had it crash an hour in. Like two weeks ago, tried it and had it crash an hour in. So I just deleted all evidence of that stream because it was very frustrating. But here we go. We finished it. And uh, that's it. Another one for the books. Uh, so stay tuned to the channel, guys, because we're going to have more videos coming your way. Both these videos and uh, some other videos uh, for FatSim. Flight controls are slowly coming to the Dash 8, slowly but surely, uh, and um, uh, yeah, so more FS Economy videos will probably come sooner than later because obviously everyone likes those as well. So guys, thank you so much for watching. Stick with me. We'll probably have a return flight sometime later this week, maybe on Friday. We'll see how time, we'll see how time goes, and uh, in the meantime, you guys stay safe out there, and uh, we will see you all real soon in the virtual skies.